I'm going to talk about the principles of management of a patient who presents with varicose veins. Uh, so you will encounter patients who come with varicose veins uh, at of various severity. Uh, the most obvious ones would probably come to us as surgeons, but the initial phases, or even patients who don't realize the cause for the problems they're having are varicose veins, would probably come to you first. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. I'll first talk a bit about the pathophysiology of varicose veins, then the risk factors, the clinical features, classification, and management. Uh, I feel pathophysiology is very important because it tells you why certain things are happening in patients with varicose veins and also how certain treatment options work. When we talk about the pathophysiology of varicose veins, we talk about three broad groups of things. Uh, sorry. One is the first is anatomical changes, second, are physiological changes and third are histological changes. Anatomical changes are what is regularly taught even to undergraduates. One main form of one main underlying cause of varicose veins are the incompetence of the valves in the long veins, mainly in the lower limbs. But remember, varicose veins can also happen due to a proximal obstruction, like deep vein thrombosis or any other obstruction more proximal. Irrespective of why the actual process begins, it creates a vicious cycle. The enlargement of the vein or the distortion of the vein due to the enlargement and engorgement worsens the vascular com valvular competence. As the vein gets bigger, the existing functional valves become incompetent and worsens the varicose vein. In addition, once the vein is maximally distended, like we see in some patients with long-standing varicose veins, once the vein is fully distended, even a small increase in the volume of blood inside that vein causes a large increase in the pressure. And this pressure is important in the chronic changes we see as well as uh, the injury. The second broad group that we talk about, about the pathophysiology are the physiological changes. Now, when any of us stand, there's obviously increased pressure at the foot compared to more proximal parts of the leg, simply because of the height of the uh, venous blood, the column of venous blood. But this does not translate into higher pressure at the capillary level. And that is because of the reflex constriction of the precapillary arterioles. When you stand, the precapillary arterioles constrict and thereby prevent the transmission of that increased uh, hydrostatic pressure into the capillaries. This loss of this reflex can cause certain changes at the capillary level. And these changes at the capillary level are one of the main things that cause the changes in skin and tissue in varicose veins. And also, this causes an increased shear stress at the level of the capillaries, which causes inflammatory cells to go into the vessel vein, uh, vein walls and the valves. The third are the histological changes. Now, the first anatomical and the physiological changes I mentioned lead to these histological changes. This includes the chronic release of inflammatory mediators, and these mediators get the white cells to go there and trap the white cells, further increasing inflammation. They increase matrix, matrix metroproteinases, which cause a breakdown of the connective tissue and releases proteolytic enzymes into the tissue. And very important, all of this 
leads to migration of red blood cells through the capillaries. And as we go on, you realize that these red cells are the key component of a lot of skin changes we see in varicose veins. As far as risk factors are concerned, I have tried to dichotomize them as non-modifiable and modifiable. Again, these risk factors are what have been identified through epidemiological studies. So advancing age, varicose veins are commoner as the patients get older. Family history of venous disease, ligamentous laxity, like hernias or flat feet. Basically, this indicates a problem in the collagen in that patient and therefore a weakness in the vein walls. Previous thrombosis like DVT, remember post-thrombotic varicose veins are one form of varicose veins, though we don't see them commonly. And of course, hereditary conditions like clippel trenaune, which I'll come back to a bit later, are also risk factors for varicose veins. Modifiable risk factors are things we can advise patients to reduce, to reduce their chances of getting varicose veins. These include things like prolonged standing, increased BMI, smoking, and pregnancy. When we look at the clinical features, there are certain symptoms that patients often come and complain. And these include discomfort or heaviness in the lower limbs. This is typically worse when they're standing and improves when they're either walking or the limb is elevated, like when they're sleeping or when they keep their leg elevated. I mean, this is obvious. Most symptoms of varicose veins are due to increased hydrostatic pressure or the pressure inside the vein, vein uh, which transmits into the soft tissue. And it would get worse when a patient is standing and improve when the elevation, but also when walking. Why walking? Walking activates the calf pump and the muscle pump, which improves the venous drainage through the deep veins. And therefore, the blood in the superficial veins through the perforators enter the deep veins and get pumped up into the body. So you no longer have venous congestion in the superficial veins and therefore walking and gentle exercises will improve the symptoms. The other set of symptoms that patients come and talk about are secondary to the soft tissue and the skin changes that occur due to varicose veins. This is itching, swelling, discoloration, and of course, ulceration. These are a spectrum starting from itching and minor veins to edema to ulceration. And we'll come to this when we talk about the classification of varicose veins. And then when we look at the examination, remember up to one-fifth of patients who have varicose veins will not have any clinical features on examination. Patients will come and complain of these things like discomfort and heaviness or even a bit of swelling. But when you examine them, you may not be able to identify varicose veins. And that is up to one-fifth of the patients you see. Of the patients who have abnormalities on examination will have a wide spectrum. It's very important that you understand what each of these words mean. A telangiectasia, also called spider veins or spid spider neva, uh, spider veins, are veins that are less than one millimeter in diameter and are intradermal. They are quite superficial. They are better appreciated on Caucasian skin than our Asian skin. But you still see, you can see patients who have telangiectasia. Reticular veins, 
on the other hand, are slightly bigger. They measure one to three, three millimeters, and they're slightly deeper, they're subdermal. Sometimes patients have a lot of these around the ankle, almost going entirely circumferentially around the, the ankle, and that is called a corona plebectetica. Corona meaning crown, so it goes all around the ankle. So a corona phlebectetica is a cutaneous manifestation. And all of these are small veins, technically not qualifying to be called varicose veins. These are all less than three millimeters. This is a comparison about what I was just discussing. So spider veins, reticular veins, and varicose veins, the main distinction is in the, in the diameter. Spider veins are about a millimeter. Reticular veins are one to three millimeters. And varicose veins are more than three millimeters. Uh, spider veins are intradermal. Reticular veins are subdermal. And varicose veins are obviously deeper to the skin. And all of these can cause symptoms like pain, discomfort, heaviness, and varicose veins will cause features of chronic venous hypertension. Spider veins and reticular veins cannot cause venous hypertension. So anything larger than three millimeters is called a varicose vein. And the traditional definition we've been using for varicose veins are dilated, elongated, torturous, subcutaneous veins. For somebody to get dilated, elongated, torturous veins, which are more than three millimeters, it is often they have an axial venous reflux. Axial meaning along the axis, along the axis of the lower limb. So it is going to be either a long saphenous or a short saphenous vein reflux. If there, are, if there is no reflux in one of these axial veins, it is rather unlikely for a patient to have varicose veins. They may have dilated veins, but it won't fit this definition of something being larger than three millimeters and being torturous. Then we come to the skin changes. So when you're examining a patient, remember one-fifth will not have symptoms, 80% will, and in that 80%, you will first look to see if you can identify varicose veins and or accompanying smaller, smaller veins like telangiectasia. Uh, and then you'd look for skin changes. There are lots of skin changes that accompany varicose veins. Their appearance obviously differs based on the skin type. One of the first things you would notice in a patient with varicose veins is the hyperpigmentation. This hyperpigmentation is due to the deposition of hemosiderin. Hemosiderin is a product of breakdown of uh, hemoglobin, and this hemoglobin comes from the breakdown of extravasated red blood cells. Remember when I spoke about the pathophysiology, I said anatomically there can be changes and physiological changes like the loss of reflex constriction of the precapillary arterioles, which lead to shear stress, which leads to red cells escaping through the capillaries. And these red cells that escape are broken down by the metal proteinases in in that tissue, releasing hemoglobin, which are broken down into hemosiderin, which deposits in this tissue and causes pigmentation. That pigmentation can be appreciated in just about any skin type. Whether it's dark or light complexion, you will see that hyperpigmentation. The second thing you would notice is this entity called status, stasis. Dermatitis. It is an eczematous rash that you, cannot, you 
see in most patients with varicose veins. It is that dry, scaly skin rash that you often see in patients. Other things you would see include things like atrophy blanche. So atrophy blanche depends, the, the appearance depends on the skin type. The picture I have here is on a Caucasian skin where you see this atrophic patch in the middle, which is actually darker than the surrounding skin. But often in the darker Asian skin, you would notice this as a white patch, similar to somewhat similar to what you would see in diabetic dermopathy. The final change or the most severe form you would see is lipidometasclerosis. This is a fibrotic process in the subcutaneous tissue. And this leads to a sham inverted champagne bottle appearance. If you look at the image on the right most edge, you would see that the leg is constricted just above the ankle because of this fibrotic process. And this, uh, the tissue above it is quite bulbous. And this gives rise to this appearance of an inverted champagne bottle. And those are the common skin changes of varicose veins. And of course, ulceration. A large number of patients with varicose veins will come with ulceration. Sometimes this ulceration in this area is the first clue for us that a patient is having varicose veins. It is often over the medial ankle or a perforating vein, but can occur over the lateral malleolus or along the course of the great or the short saphenous vein. This ulceration is characteristically never in the forefoot or above the level of the knee. Above the level of the knee is more or less obvious. You need the changes I told you. And if you don't have this high, venous hypertension, which is a function of the height of the venous blood column, you won't get these changes. And obviously, the changes above knee is not strong enough for it to cause changes or ulceration. Uh, I haven't been able to find why it doesn't happen in the forefoot. So, but it has it is generally described as not affecting the forefoot. These ulcers can be quite painful, and this pain is quite exquisite when this ulcer is infected. Characteristically, this ulcer is shallow, has an exudative and a granulating base. I'm sure all of you would have seen patients with varicose vein ulcers. And it's a very characteristic ulcer. It's not very deep. It's in this characteristic area. And when you see that base, you know it is a venous ulcer. Now that we have looked at all the clinical features of varicose veins or the common clinical features of varicose veins, we need to look at the classification of varicose, vein, varicose veins or the venous disorders. So everything we've spoken so far are clinical manifestations. And that is the C of this CAP classification. So C1 is still in jactasia and reticular veins. C2 is varicose veins or recurrent varicose veins. So anything recurrent in this clinical manifestation list is denominated by this let, uh, small r in addition to the classification. And C3 is edema. C Beyond that are the changes or the stronger changes, more prominent changes you would see with varicose veins. C4 includes pigmentation, lipidomatosclerosis, and corona febectetica. C5 is an healed ulcer. And C6 is an active ulcer 
or a recurrent active hours. Now, C1 to C3, I said, are not considered chronic venous insufficiency. But C4 to 6 are things that constitute of chronic venous insufficiency. So that is the C of the CAP or the clinical manifestations. Next is etiology. So when we look at etiology, it has three components, congenital, primary and secondary. Congenital are things like klippel trenoni syndrome, which is one of, of which varicose veins are one manifestation. Clipper Trenoni syndrome is a problem of soft tissue and blood vessels. You can see in this picture that the affected limb is larger. It causes gigantism or hemihypertrophy of the limb together with varicose veins. Now, the cause for these varicose veins in Clipper Trenoni syndrome is an abnormality of the deeper veins. So we can't really treat the superficial veins because those veins are dilated because they help drain the blood from the lower limb. In contrast, the commonest form or the commonest etiology for the patients we see are primary, meaning it is independent of any disease process. It is due to those pathophysiological changes I described in the first slide. The reason we investigate patients is that we don't want to miss secondary causes. Secondary causes can be classified as intravenous causes or extravenous causes. And as the name suggests, Intravenous causes, in, in the intravenous causes, the problem is inside the vein, like DVT. Post thrombotic syndrome is one of the main causes of secondary varicose veins. Extravenous, as the name suggests, is due to any, any pathology occurring outside the vein. This can, outside the vein, that we are interested in. So this can either be a central venous hypertension, where there is a problem in the IVC, or compression of the vein extrinsically. And that is the E of the CAP classification. Next, we come to A, or the anatomy of varicose veins. And this can be classified as superficial, deep, and perforators. This classification is quite simple. It is based on, it, on the relationship of the vein to the deep fascia. If a vein is superficial to the deep fascia, it's a superficial venous system. If it's deep to the deep fascia, it's the deep venous system. And anything going through the fascia are perforators. If I were to quickly recap your anatomy knowledge of the varicose veins or the, or the veins of the lower limb, there are two main veins superficial to the deep fascia, and that is the long saphenous vein, starting at the femoral vein, going on the medial aspect of the thigh, just behind the knee, and coming anterior along the medial aspect of the shin to end in the dorsal arch of the foot. And the short saphenous vein, which drains to the popliteal vein and has a more vertical course along the back of the lower limb, back of the leg, and going on to the lateral aspect of the ankle and the foot. So that is your superficial venous system of the lower limb. And these are often the veins that get enlarged in varicose veins mainly the long saphenous, but also the short saphenous. The deep venous systems, as the name suggests, are the veins 
that are deep to the deep fascia. So from the bottom to the top, you have the posterior tibial and the anterior tibial and peroneal veins or the fibular vein joining to form the popliteal vein, which ascends becoming the femoral vein, joins the deep femoral vein on the thigh and becomes the external iliac, which drains into the pelvis. And of course, the perforators. These are the veins that go through the fascia, connecting the deep and the superficial veins. Why this is important or why these perforators are important is that your deep veins are helped by the muscle pump to pump the blood back to the body. So as they empty, they suck the blood from the superficial system into the deep system through these perforators. Any problems with these perforators can give rise to varicose veins, which we see as manifestations in the superficial venous system. And these perforators also have valves. Therefore, they prevent blood from the deep system entering the superficial system. And finally, coming to the pathophysiology or the P of the CAP classification. Uh, pathophysiology can be either obstruction or reflux. There's a typing mistake there. It's a reflux. So obstruction is when there is more proximal obstruction, like thrombosis, that impedes the flow of the superficial veins. And reflux is a problem of the valves that allow blood to come back along the axial veins. And that is the CF classification of venous disorders. And it's very important that when you see a patient and when you're trying to diagnose somebody as having varicose veins, that you describe along this CF classification what the disease manifestation is. For example, a patient can be a C5, meaning he has a healed ulcer. EP, that is a primary etiology, AS, that is a superficial venous system, and PR, that is reflux. So that is the use of the CF classification. So when you mean, when you write that down and refer somebody, refer a patient to another person, they will also understand exactly what the disease process the patient is having. That was for classification, classifi uh, classifying the disease. Next, we look at assessment of severity. Now, these are not commonly used in the clinical practice, especially in Sri Lanka. But if you wanted to objectively measure the disease severity in a patient, these are the possible things, tools you can use. Some of them are completed by the doctor at an outpatient clinic. Some of them are completed, are questionnaires to be completed by the patient. They have different scoring systems and different weight weighting for different components. But all of them assess the severity of varicose veins. How do we diagnose a patient with varicose veins? It's sometimes very obvious that a patient is having varicose veins, but for the times that it is not obvious, how do we do it? It's based on the symptoms, the examination findings, and investigation findings. If the patient has the classical symptoms like pain in the legs, fatigue, heaviness, especially if it develops towards the end of the day, that's very suggestive of varicose veins. Next, you would examine them to identify and confirm or exclude what your suspicions are. The confirmatory test for you to identify is a duplex ultrasound. And this will show 
among other things, what veins are affected, whether it's a long saphiness, short saphiness, and sometimes we get aberrant veins that don't conform to either of these two. You would also confirm the presence of refluxing blood along that varicose vein. You would look for tributaries, you would look for perforators, whether there are perforating incompetence. And very important, this duplex scan will look at the deep veins. It is very important that we know that the deep veins are normal before we plan treatment and also to know that these varicose veins are not secondary to a problem in the deep vein system. So a venous duplex is an essential test in diagnosing and assessing the severity or the disease pattern of varicose veins. Are there any questions up to that point? Okay, so we'll move on. When we come to the management, there are different ways that we can approach this problem. Either we can have look at it from a clinical severity based approach or the presence and location of reflux. If we were to look at the clinical severity, if the patient is asymptomatic, we do nothing. There is nothing to achieve by treating asymptomatic varicose veins. If the veins are not causing symptoms, if the veins are not bothering the patient, we don't do any interventions. The only exception is cosmetic concern. Again, this is less of a concern in the darker complexion because the veins are not that obvious, but sometimes in fairer skin, the veins are very obvious and the dark color is very obvious. And sometimes patients insist on treatment because of the cosmesis. And that's the only indication to do something for asymptomatic veins. If the patients are symptomatic, we treat the cause of that varicose vein. And that is why we were talking about the, the anatomy the pathology and the underlying causes of varicose veins. If it's axial reflux, the management is different to perforate incompetence. So we need to identify the problem and deal with the problem. The other situation that you might encounter patients are bleeding. It's very simple to deal with a patient with an acute varicose bleed. Remember, these are venous bleeds. The highest venous pressure you'd get is about 20 25 millimeters mercury. Can easily be controlled by pressure. All you need, if there's an ulcer or a wound, is to dress that wound and do a compression bandage with a crepe, uh, with a compression, compression therapy with a crepe bandage. As soon as you achieve compression, the bleeding will settle. Remember, when you're applying this bandage, you need to apply it irrespective of the common place for these things to bleed are near the ankle. But your compression bandage need to come up to at least the knee joint. You cannot apply pressure only at the point of bleeding. The moment you apply this bandage from the foot all the way up to the knee, the bleeding will settle because that pressure will cut make the vein collapse. The second approach of treating varicose veins is looking at the presence and the location of reflux. If there is no axial vein reflux, like no problems in the long saphenous or the short saphenous vein, we can use either sclerotherapy or excision. I'll come to these techniques a bit later. If there is superficial vein reflux, 
in the long or the short sucking veins, slurotherapy will not work. The, there is a higher, very high chance of recurrence when you use slurotherapy alone. That is the time to ablate the vein. And I'll talk about the different techniques of dealing with veins later. If there is reflux of the deep veins, there is, you, the patient will need surgery. These patients are very rare. We hardly see patients who come with problems in their deep veins. And of course, perforatory reflux or perforatory incompetence requires treatment for the perforators. I often get asked about non-pharmacological or medical therapy varicose veins. And these are some th things that you can try in just about every patient with varicose veins you will encounter. Elevation, meaning raising the leg above the level of the body, is very effective. Most changes, be it in the veins, the subcutaneous tissue or the skin are due to venous hypertension and elevation simply settles or relieves this venous hypertension. Exercise is also very important because with exercise, the activity of the calf muscle pump is increased and that increases the drainage of venous blood through the deep veins. So exercise is very important to reduce pressure in the superficial vein, assuming this is a primary varicose vein. Skin care using emollients and moisturizers are also important because of the stasis dermatitis that these patients have. Often the itching and other changes can be reduced by using proper skincare products. And of course, compression therapy and care for the ulcers, which I'll go to in detail later. Compression therapy is one of the mainstays of treatment of varicose veins. And the benefits of compression therapy include the reduction of discomfort and pain, reducing the severity and the extent of edema, improvement of skin changes and ulcer healing. Except for dealing with the actual varicose vein, compression therapy can be used to treat just about every manifestation of varicose veins. Of course, we cannot use varicose veins in everybody. Uh, we cannot use compression therapy in everybody with varicose veins. Obviously, if there are patients with peripheral artery disease, we cannot use compression therapy. That is because this compression will further reduce the blood supply to the varicose vein, uh, to the lower limb, and worsen the peripheral vascular disease. Uh, the next instance where we cannot use veins, uh, we cannot use compression therapy for varicose veins, is when there is superficial or deep vein thrombosis. This is because this compression therapy cannot be used in an acute situation like thrombosis. And of course, acute infection because it is painful. Uh, there was a question about elevation and how much to elevate. Uh, it is difficult to recommend because unlike in lymphedema or cellulitis, elevation in varicose veins is not a mainstay of the long-term treatment. It is a temporizing measure. So generally, when we talk about elevation for the resolution of edema, or pain or venous hypertension, 
I would recommend about three pillows, which would come to about six inches when they're lying down. That is a rule of thumb. There is no uh, def defined height or elevation. We can classify compression therapy as static and dynamic. Static compression therapy can be further subdivided into compression bandages and compression hosiery or stockings. Bandages can be elastic and inelastic. I'll go to more detail on this because this is one of the main things that we use in the outpatient setup. When we look at compression bandages, they can be either single layer or multi layer. And they can be inelastic or elastic. Inelastic is when you use a very tight bandage which has no elastic properties of its own. And this forms a tight scaffolding around the lower limb. How this works is when is with high working pressure of muscle contraction so when the patient walks and the when and when the muscles contract the tight bandage together with the muscle contractions will facilitate venous return but it does nothing at rest because it cannot ex exert any additional pressure at rest elastic compression bandages on the other hand conform to the changes of the leg size and they sustain the compression during activity and rest. So most of the time what we use are elastic compression bandages but you'd realize what we use commonly is a very Sri Lankan method of compression bandages. When a patient is using these compression bandages, it needs to be applied at least once a week, if not twice a week, because this elasticity will reduce and in elastic bandaging, it will come loose. The picture shows a single layer inelastic bandage which is a cotton bandage which, we, which you can wrap around the leg of the patient. Multi-layer compression bandage, what we colloquially called strapping, requires four layers of bandaging, which we generally don't do because we don't have this material. The first layer is a padding layer of cotton. Uh, this is the one that is in contact with the skin. And the role of this cotton layer or the padding layer is to protect the skin and the tissue against pressure necrosis due to the pressure exerted by the other bandages. When you think about it, and when you do the strapping, you'll realize that at the ankle, your lateral and the medial malleoli are quite obvious, they are jutting out. And if you were to bandage with a crepe bandage straight over that area, the pressure at those malleoli would be quite high and the pressure just behind the malleoli would be quite low and it will be effective. Remember your long saphenous vein is just anterior to the malleolus. And if you don't exert pressure onto that, long saphenous vein, your strapping is not effective. The, the job of the padding is to exert a more even pressure around all of the soft tissue along the entire circumference of the leg of the soft uh, into the soft tissue. So padding is a first layer. Obviously, if the patient needs a dressing for, a, for an ulcer, that would be put first and then the padding goes on. The second layer it's a crepe bandage. This, when you use a cotton crepe, a cotton crepe bandage, it provides an extra absorbency and smoothens the padding layer. In 
the traditional four layer multi compression bandage, the crepe is not meant to exert a significant amount of pressure. Though when we use it, we use that crepe to exert pressure because we have none of the two other two layers of bandages. The third layer is an extensible elastic bandage. If you stretch this to 50% of its normal length and overlap 50%, 50 50, it exerts 17 millimeters mercury of pressure. That's the first layer that actually exerts pressure in compression therapy. And you have a cohesive elastic bandage, which you apply again with compression. And together, these four layers will provide 40 millimeters of mercury, up to 40 millimeters of mercury of pressure, which is higher than most chronic venous hypertension pressures. And this is how a multi layer compression bandage is applied. Now, remember, this is different to the strapping we do because we have, we don't have these additional layers. What we use is cotton and a crepe and maybe elastoplaster on top of that. The alternative to this strapping is the use of a graded compression stocking. Why do we call it graded? That is because the pressure is highest at the level of the hind foot and the ankle and it gradually reduces to the top. It still exerts pressure at the top level, but it is less. And this grade or the graded application of pressure improves venous flow from the level of the ankle to the level of the knee. For this to be effective, you need a minimum of 20 to 30 millimeters mercury at the ankle. If the patient has severe chronic venous disease, the patient would require more pressure, something in the range of 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. The advice you give would be that the patient needs to put this first thing in the morning when the edema is minimum and they keep it until they go to bed at night. Obviously, again, any treatment of the ulcer is done before the stocking is put. These stockings lose their efficacy, so they need to be replaced every six months, give or take. The other problem, especially in Sri Lanka, is that they can cause sweating and itching. So that's the main reason why patients don't like this. Dynamic compression is the use of an intermittent pneumatic compression pump. This is used for other situations like the prevention of DVT, but has very little evidence in treatment of varicose veins. Next, we come to the care of ulcers in sorry, patients with varicose veins. Remember, antibiotics are not going to heal ulcers. Antibiotics are only useful in patients who have an infection. If there is no infection, antibiotics are not going to do anything. An ulcer will need debris more. That depends on the situation of the ulcer. Uh, it, the, it is beyond the scope of this lecture to decide on what ulcers need what treatment uh, but if the ulcer base is unhealthy if it has slough or necrotic areas those areas need to be removed there are lots of wound care products available in the market some expensive, some cheap, but there is very little evidence for any specific form of treatment. Cadexamiodine is what's called adsorb. There is no evidence 
that irisorb increases as a healing in varicose veins. Sulfur sulfur acid, which is commonly used for burns, are quite difficult to use for penis ulcers uh, because they form a pseudo eschar on top of that ulcer. And in addition, there is no specific evidence that they heal ulcers. Same goes for growth factors. There is no evidence in the use. So in summary, none of the specific dressings have any advantage over another or a more simple dressing for ulcer healing. And there are things that are clearly ineffective for venous ulcers, like hyperbaric oxygen or therapeutic ultrasound. So simple wound dressings and addressing the underlying cause, in which in this case, venous hypertension will heal ulcers. Again, I get asked about medical management, about flavonoids. I know there are some available in the market. It comes and goes every few years. Bioactive drugs like flavonoids can be used to reduce the edema and the pain. There is no evidence that flavonoids increase ulcer healing. The other option is pentoxifilin, again, not widely available. I've only kept that in the interest of knowledge. It is not commonly used, especially here. And, of course, we come to surgical options. Uh, I'll, I'll go into detail about this, just for your knowledge. Uh, the options we have include saphenephemeral ligation, and the stripping of the long saphenous vein, microphlebectomy, what's called stab avulsion, ligation of the perforators, sclerotherapy, lace ablation, and RFA ablation or radiofrequency ablation. In saphenofemoral ligation, we dissect up to the saphenofemoral junction, identify the junction, ligate the saphenous vein where it drains into the femoral vein, ligate the branches of the saphenous vein, and then remove the saphenous vein. In stab avulsions, we make small incisions, generally less than three millimeters, and remove the long saphenous or the short saphenous vein. This is often a cosmetic procedure, and that is why it's called a stab avulsion. The cut, less than three millimeters, is generally not visible, and it gives very good cosmesis. And because it's less than three millimeters, it often does not require any surgery. Perforate ligation is not commonly done. I've kept this in uh, for in the sake of interest. This is a process called subfascial endoscopic for perforator uh, surgery or SEPS, where a scope is inserted, perforators are identified and ligated. Again, not commonly done, but it is an option to treat perforator reflux. Sclerotherapy is a very useful tool. We use the compound called sodium tetradecyl sulfate or STDS for sclerotherapy. And STDS can be injected directly as the compound itself or mixed using two syringes with uh, distilled water and air to create foam. The advantage of creating foam is that you, by using the same volume of STDS, you get a much larger volume of foam. So the contact with the intima of the vein is increased and therefore the success rate is increased. This is how sclerotherapy is done. It, is, it can be done under either ultrasound guidance 
or if the veins are very distended, you can inject them without ultrasound guidance. And it is simply a matter of identifying the vein and injecting either the sclerosant STDS or foam of STDS. Laser ablation uses laser energy through a fiber to burn the vein. And that process is called selective photothermolysis. Photo meaning light, thermolysis meaning thermal energy to lyse. This energy of the laser has direct and indirect actions. When the light gets, when the vein absorbs the light, the vein wall heats up and that's a direct action. Indirect actions include the steam bubbles generated from the blood and the conduction of heated blood from the laser. Contraindications to lasers include acute DVT. We generally don't treat varicose veins of acute thrombosis. We wait for them to settle. Pregnancy and congenital abnormalities. We don't treat pregnant patients with varicose veins for two reasons. One, quite a number of these varicose veins will settle in about six weeks after pregnancy when the hormonal changes and the pressure on the veins of the pelvis reduces after childbirth in about six weeks, most varicose veins will improve or disappear. So we generally wait for about six weeks after pregnancy before deciding on treatment. Clippertronani syndrome, as I mentioned earlier, the superficial veins are distended because the deep veins have a problem. We therefore cannot ligate or remove the superficial veins. They are needed by the lower limb. So in all these patients or all these categories, laser ablation is contraindicated. Radio frequency ablation, again similar to laser, uses a different energy source called radio frequency to burn the vein, which then narrows and fibrosis, reducing or, or obliterating the axial reflux. When we look at outcomes from treatment, we look at three major things. One is the recurrence rate following uh, therapy, recurrence of varicose veins. Next is the quality of life of patients. And third is ulcer healing. When it comes to recurrence, if the diagnosis is accurate and you've treated properly, ablation and surgery all have similar recurrence rates, which is in the range of 10 to 15%. Uh, remember, sclerotherapy has higher recurrence rates because if it's used in patients with axillary flux, there will be recurrence. It is fine to be used in patients without reflux. When you look at quality of life, patients who have laser for their varicose veins have a better quality of life. But remember, this improved quality of life does not mirror closure rates. It is only their quality of life following treatment. Ulcer healing, irrespective of what treatment we give, if we've dealt with the axial reflux by either stripping of the vein or ablation of the vein, it will improve or it will lead to ulcer healing. Uh, and that is how different treatment options uh, affect outcomes following treatment. There was a question about treatment with uh, clopidogrel and what we do. Uh, and it depends. If the patient comes with acute bleeding, meaning a bleeding varicose vein or a bleeding ulcer, compression therapy is all you need. 
whether the patient is on clopidogrel or not, it doesn't make a difference. So you can use uh, compression therapy and that will take care of the varicose vein. If a patient is going to undergo surgery, we generally get uh, wait until clopidogrel can be omitted for a week because bleeding when a patient is on clopidogrel is very difficult to treat. So we generally prefer to wait for a week of clopidogrel. Also, because varicose veins are not life-threatening conditions, and if a patient is on clopidogrel and that cannot be omitted for one week, that means the patient is having a more serious condition, which is far more life-threatening, like maybe ischemic heart disease and an insertion of a drug eluting stent or a recent CVA. So we prefer to wait until that settles. Remember, compression therapy alone can heal varicose veins. It is slower, but it, it is very effective. So we can use compression therapy if, a, if surgery needs to be postponed. Aspirin is fine. We generally let patients continue aspirin because the antiplatelet effect of aspirin is not that uh, bad for us to not go ahead with any surgery. The advantage of four layers is that you can generate a pressure of up to 40 millimeters of mercury, which is sometimes required for patients with more extensive or severe disease. Four layer or over two layer, I don't know about whether there are any randomized trials comparing. If your question is about the use of cotton and a crepe versus standard four layer, the primary problem of using cotton and a standard crepe bandage is we don't know what pressure we are exerting. It is difficult to gauge the pressure using a crepe bandage because it has no indicator of how much we are stretching it. The standard four layer bandage, which the third layer has sometimes an indicator which tells us how much we are stretching it. And then we know if we stretch it to 50% and overlap 50%, it gives 17 millimeters of mercury. The main disadvantage of using our standard crepe bandage is that we can't guess the pressure that we are generating. Uh, advice to patients, well, obviously when they have this four layer, they cannot get it wet. So they need to take precautions about that. Uh, they also need to make sure that that bandage remains in that length or the height that the doctor applied it and it remains tight. Uh, for this strapping to be effective, we generally need to incorporate it up to the knee joint at least. There is no point applying it anything below. So your proximal target should be at least the knee joint. Sometimes the veins are extensive. We would do it for up to the thigh, but often it is up to the knee joint. You start it below the ankle because otherwise it will just slip up. So you start it somewhere in the foot. The problem is if you apply it halfway in the foot and if it's tight, you're going to get edema of the foot that is not covered. So it is often better to include most of the foot in your bandage and keep strapping up, up to the knee joint. Okay, so in the absence of questions, I will end the lecture. If you have any questions, you can email me.